I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, and I think uh, for practical purpose, I'm gonna turn the beginning part over to uh, Brian because we need to reorganize the board as far as chair, vice chair and, um, and, uh, and clerk go. So uh, Brian, um, maybe you can uh, lead us through that, please. Yep, so we had our annual town election yesterday and Joyce was reelected to the position of select board. And the board traditionally after the annual town election reorganizes. So this is our opportunity to do so. We would need a motion to um, select a chairperson and then a second and then a vote. I move that we have uh, Fred Orlowski be our chairperson this year. Second. Um, Joyce does Oh, isn't it Joyce doesn't need, doesn't Joyce do it still? Chair? Oh, no, I was chair the last the past year. Yeah. Yeah, we normally slide that around, and I think uh, the next in line. No, or, I, meant, I meant you should do this roll call. Oh, the roll call you thing? Roll call, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, are, uh, so, Fred, do you accept the nomination? Yes. Okay, so roll call vote. Uh, those in favor, John? Yes. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay, I'm right. turning the chair over to Fred now. Oh, yep. I mean, over to Fred now. Okay, and I the motion to nominate Jonathan Edwards as vice chair. I'll second that. Okay, all those in favor, roll call. Joyce? Yes. Jonathan? Yeah. And uh, Fred, yes. Okay, uh, I no, oh, I can't nominate myself. And I I'll make a motion to nominate uh, Joyce Palmer Fortune as the clerk. Second. I accept the nomination. Okay, roll call, Jonathan. Yeah. Fred, yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay. Okay, next item is Discuss and assign department liaisons. Brian, you, I think you shared something with us. Yeah. Uh, information on that. Yep, I sent to you the, um, the current assignments, which are Joyce for the police department and schools, Fred for the fire department, water department, Jonathan for the town offices and highway department, and then the, the um, town administrator liaison usually rotates with the chairperson of the select board. So that would be uh, time to discuss whether you want to change those or you could really change them anytime you want, but um, we, we typically discuss it at the beginning of the hmm. beginning of the year. Personally, I think it works pretty well though, the one, other than nobody wants to hang out with Savini. Yeah, oh, no, I'm, well, I'm willing to keep the, the assignments I have unless someone is really um, uh, itching to be the school or the police liaison. No, no, I'm, I'm happy with uh, the two I have, the fire and the water. So do well, we need to take any action on this? Brian? And you'll have administrative now, Fred. No, okay. Yeah, you, you're, yeah. You're you have to deal to with Brian. Mm. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Maybe I'm not in the office very much, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, uh, meeting minutes of May, 7, May 27th. I have no comments. Can I make a motion to approve minutes of May 27th? Second. I'll second that. Okay, roll we'll call. All those in favor? Jonathan? Yeah. Joyce? Yeah. Fred? Yes. Vendor and payroll warrants? I think Joyce signed the last ones that we received, right? So we're yeah. all set. Unless anybody has uh, comments? Okay, moving on, public comment. Anybody from the public? We, I see one or two people on. Anybody have any comments that items that are not on the agenda? No, okay. Moving on to the COVID-19 state of emergency. We discuss, uh, review and consider modifications to the following documents. Okay, the first one was the 
directive and town employees returning to work during the COVID-19 pandemic? How's that, Ryan? Are we proposing something different here? Or? No, I, it, it's, I think it's good just having this as a continuing, uh, continuing item so that we can address things as they arise. Um, okay. We've been open since June 1st. We've had, I don't know, maybe less than 20 people, close, maybe close to 20 people. Um, everybody's respectful, wears the masks. Um, people wait outside if there's somebody at the window. Um, it's, it's worked out pretty well. Uh, and again, for, for those listening, the, the town offices are, are open on a limited basis on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 8 a.m. to 12 noon. Or you can contact the department and make an appointment if those times don't work. Um, so I think we'll be continuing with that until we get further guidance from the state. The, <coughs> what the board has, the board's elected to um, continue the virtual meetings. And the reason behind that is there's there's still the, the limit on gatherings of, of uh, 10 or more people, and that makes it difficult to hold an in-person meeting for large committees or small committees, but who are going to attract a crowd if we can't exclude somebody from a meeting if we're at nine or 10 out of whichever one it is, then we would have likely cancel the meeting. Um, so at least for the foreseeable future, I think we'll continue with the with the virtual meetings, but overall, it's, it's been pretty well. It's gone pretty well. Ryan, I just have a quick question. Um, as far as restaurants go, are, are, is the town or are you guys requiring them to get a permit to open for outside service? Is there a permit in town for such such a permit? I don't know of. Um, and some towns are requiring restaurants to, to get a permit. There's a fee for a permit. They get a permit so they can have outdoor consumption of food and beverage. So in terms of, in terms of, so there is an, there is an extra permit that needs to be obtained if an establishment want, wants to serve alcohol, okay. if, it, if it falls outside the description of their premises. Um, so, um, Amy had forwarded the ABCC, uh, guidance to the Waitley Inn. Okay. Um, it just, was just for alcohol then. So yeah. Not for food. Um, the way I, I've seen correspondences between the Waitley Inn, the building inspector, um, fire chief, um, Keith, I think you checked out the barriers today to see if they were obstructing traffic. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I had the same, same opinion Keith had. I mean, they're. If, if you're pulling up to the intersection and you're trying to look, it's there's going to be a, a small obstruction. But if you stop at the stop sign like you're supposed to and you um, and you look, there, yeah. there isn't a bad um, obstruction there. It, I think, it, again, it forces people to stop. As so yeah, you actually have to stop at a stop sign? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. They could just yield yeah. like they want to. <laughs> I'm not driving anymore then. Some people um, tell me they're just suggestions anyways. Right. <laughs> the, but, but Brian, we're not, we're not seeking an extra fee for that. I don't want to charge the Waitley in. Okay, good. Yeah, that's what some towns are doing. That's why I, was, I didn't know if it was mandated yeah. that they had to have a permit to eat, um, to eat outside or. If we needed to vote on it, I would make a motion that anybody whom we've already given a license to if they really need another permit from us, that it be done at no extra charge for the outdoor dining, because they're being constrained by the state, mm -hmm. you know, to that they can only offer outdoor dining. And if by some, you know, crack in the law means they can't really do it, then I think we ought to do whatever we can to facilitate them complying with the law without imposing a burden on them. I think that's that I agree with the that. least we can do, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I don't know if the Board of Health, I haven't, spoke, I haven't spoken with a friend about that specifically. I don't know if the Board of Health had a, had a fee or anything, but I know that they've, they've done their due diligence the way Leon has. Um, okay. But, but the, doesn't the way Leon serve right now out, outside on their patio or whatever anyway? Yeah. 
Now, I assume that includes liquor as well. I think it I does. Uh, I would imagine it does. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a pretty significant expansion outside of the, the description. Yeah. What the ABCC wants is, is they're allowing, they're allowing uh, local licensing authorities uh, the ability to amend the, the description of the premises, essentially, without fees, without public hearings, those types of things. Um, and that would be in effect until, I think it says November 1st, or if the state of emergency is lifted before that. Okay. So, so should we have a motion similar to what Joyce was saying that, that we were, we're amending our bylaw that, that, that describes the, the location for serving alcohol to extend to, um, to notif notifying us what that new footprint is, which I, obviously the Waitley's already done that because Jim and John have been out there. Yeah. Or do we need to take any action at this? I, I don't know. That's the question. They, 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 they need to provide us with, with that information before we would take a vote. And that's been, that, that was sent out to the Whaley in a couple of days ago. Right. But maybe, you, I mean, when informally you can assure them that we're, at least I am of a mind that whatever paperwork they have to do, there's not going to be another fee associated with them. Right. Okay. Now, what what about like place like muffins? They they have outdoor what seating? Do they serve outside or can you drink? No. They don't serve. They don't serve alcohol. They you sell alcohol. It, but you can't consume you it. Can't consume it on, right. on premises. Yeah. yeah. And all their all their food is counter service, I believe. Yeah. They do have a couple of tables outside. I know the Tom's hot dog stand. The only thing they've changed is they just set their picnic tables back up. Um, so they're mm, well spaced out. out. Yeah. But yeah, they still, most people still have masks. They still have it marked out for ordering and, and such, but um, they put the picnic tables out in the back and space those out. So that was the only other thing I see. I haven't seen anything set up at the um, truck stop as far as any, any outdoor. Um, so I had an email from, from somebody at Maria Energy, I think the owners of the truck stop they were asking what they needed to do to, to do outside dining. So I got them in touch with the building inspector and Jim, it, and it, it sounds like they just want to set up picnic tables, not necessarily serve outside. In Oh, so they're not going to serve outside in the parking lot. Uh, right, they want to be able to do takeout and have people, have people eat at tables instead right. of in their trucks. Right. Right. Uh, but, that makes sense. Yeah. The, the parking lot would be problematic there because of the traffic flow of all the 18 mil trucks. Right. Yep. Okay. Well, the, the only okay. other thing I just wanted to point out is we are going to be keeping an eye on parking traffic for the Waitley Inn. I know that was a concern that came up because their um, dining area is set up in that, that front parking lot. Mm. Uh, so we're going to be kind of keeping an eye out for people parking in the road just to see just to see what what kind of traffic it it, uh, it causes any hazards or anything like that that was the only other thing okay moving on to the next item is order reopening town buildings to the public for limited hours and appointment only we've been doing that since our since what june 1st i guess yeah the only other thing we might want to discuss, Jonathan, you might, do we want to talk about Hurley Field a little bit? Well, yeah, I, I, I'm of the mind that we can start allowing practices and, and maybe that was, or let's, let's say, I, I think we should allow organized practices um, as, as long as they maintain social distancing guidelines put out by the governor. Um, I know adult baseball is looking to do that. I, there are a couple of youth leagues that are looking to do that in anticipation of potentially playing games starting in July. So they want to start practicing now. Uh, I don't see any reason why we should limit that again, as long as they're um, abiding by social distancing guidelines put out by the governor. That That's allowed under phase two as well. So 
from the, the governor's order for right. practices. And they, we, we have, so we've seen one adult team down there practicing. They were, they were social distancing and um, there wasn't that many of them, um, but they have started that already. I don't know if they've asked. And this would make it easier on us because what's happening is people are going down there sort of ad hoc mm -hmm. and we're going to get into scheduling conflicts because two, two groups are going to decide to go down there and they haven't been in touch with us. So this, this better enables us to schedule the facility. Um, and also we need to start to, to, to charge for the, for the use. So does this address uh, spectators? How would we uh, handle spectators then? The guidance that I've seen from phase two is that, is that you can have, actually, well, it was for youth sports, you can have one, I believe it was one parent or guardian per player. Right. Right. And they've got to socially distance. Right. But if you have other, other people coming to watch, what, yeah. as long as they're socially distancing and what, wearing masks, that's acceptable? Yeah, but these are just practices right now, Fred. So. I, I I mostly feel badly for anyone who comes and watches a practice that's not affiliated with the team at all. I think that I think the general I think in practice as long as people are socially distancing I I think the board of health and, and Jim can speak for the police but I think we're not that strict. Yeah, we're we're not giving anybody a hard time if they're practicing social distancing. All right, Jim, are you going to give them a hard time? If, someone, if, if there's a parent that's watching because they don't want to travel, what about wearing masks? Uh, if they're more than six feet apart to social distancing, then they don't really have to wear a mask anyways. It's just if they're in a, you know, if they're within a six feet and they're not social distancing, they should be wearing masks. So if we see 20 or 30 people standing in a circle, you know, we, we may just pull up and say, hey, you know, you guys got to spread out or put a mask on or something. But other than that, we're not gonna. Yeah, not gonna I would say it's four, four or five. If four or five parents were standing around, I think that's you know we want to encourage that. But yeah, we, that's fine. But yeah. they need to wear masks. Yeah, they need to wear masks. Yeah, I mean if they're spread out all over the field well, and they're no, but, feet apart, but, but yeah. But that's not the way it works. Parents, they see each other and they're gonna socialize. Oh yeah, that's six they feet. We're in the four feet, and they creep closer and closer together. Right. Do we need so to that's an accepted rule um, if you're if you're outdoors that six feet apart or wear a mask correct um, is that same rule for indoors um, I think if you're indoors you have to wear a mask I think that's what the governor's orders still say okay but outdoors it's either six feet apart or you have to wear a mask <clears throat> okay thanks sorry I think I interrupted your friend Okay, so do we need to change any of the signing that's at Hurley Field at the entrance? Isn't there some signs? I, I can go by and pick that up tomorrow and just take it away. Or change the wording if we need to, but okay. I think it might be good to have a sign to be able to point to that says, hey, these are the rules, the governor's rules that we expect people to abide. That um, it, reminding that. people what they are, um, would, would that, the, I mean, it doesn't have to be a fancy sign. It could be handwritten for now and maybe produced in short order. I mean, it'll take it'll take me ten minutes to revise the sign that was created before, and it'll cost us fifteen dollars to to have one created. So, <clears throat> in, in the span of an hour. Yeah, yeah. I think it helps people to have uh, a sign to point to, you know, rather than saying, "Well, don't you know this is it?" and having an argument about what the rules are. It's there. It's posted. Um, and you know, it would, it would help Jim enforcing the rules if he's down there and it would help, you know, fellow, you know, parents and anybody who happens to be there who cares about that sort of thing. Yeah, that's fair. We also have the, uh, the elementary school fields, playgrounds and basketball courts and such. There's a sign there and that's taped off. And then we have the Smith college property on, um, Poplar Hill road. Those are the only, the, the other two locations where there's signage for, you know, outdoor recreation stuff. So those may need to be changed as well. How about by the how about by the fire station? The ball field. <laughs> no one's using that right now though. 
So there's no signing here. Either. Because rec sports aren't going to happen this spring or summer, that field's not going to be used. Okay. I think on the and on the website we can put a link to the the guidance from EEA about phase two sports. Right? When people go and reserve the reserve the field, they go through the website or no? No, they, well, they go to the website and then the email goes to me. Okay. So Okay. And I'll, and I'll and I'll let people know. I'll I'll let the different teams know what, what the policy is gonna be in my email when I when I say you can <clears throat> work at them. Okay, and I assume the the uh, town hall is, is still closed to anybody and all events. Uh, I but I see stuff listed on our, our website. I don't know if people are, are confused and figuring. Well, is the town hall open? Uh, and I know the practice was just to list the the event and no no agenda before. And, and that's not any different now what I see on the website. I don't know if somehow either we need to not list it or say uh, not allowed or Zoom only, I, I, I don't know. I think these were recurring meetings that are coming back up, so. Right. We can get them off the calendar. Okay. Okay, moving, moving on, uh, next item was to finalize the location, date, time, and other logistics for holding the annual town meeting. And I know Brian has, has put together a spreadsheet based on information he gathered uh, himself and, and from Joyce, and, and I got some information from Quanquat Farms. Uh, Brian, do you want to talk about it? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the best place is the is the Whitley Elementary School, the side yard. Um, it seems to be the biggest amount of space, has the best parking arrangement. Um, we can get electricity to the field, and it's Joyce Matt can I think Matt's available that day, right? Yeah, we have, we reserved Matt for that day. So we have the, the sound equipment that we need for the 23rd. We'll have electricity. Um, I've talked to Keith about um, helping set up uh, chairs six feet apart on that on that afternoon or, or morning. Um, and I talked to Jim a little bit. Jim said that he or he and he will, he and or Don will be there, um, but we don't expect that there'll be any traffic issues or parking issues. Um, one thing that we should set, if we're going to go the 23rd at six, we should set maybe two or three rain dates, um, that way we don't have to re-advertise and we can make that the moderator has, has discretion to, um, continue town meeting to the rain date. So, um, we would need the moderator and Lynn to show up and continue the, continue the meeting. Um, but that, that seems like the, the most feasible way to do it. Deerfield held theirs and Sunderland held theirs, both outdoors. Um, so I don't, I don't know if we have questions or concerns about, about doing that. We'll have some bug spray available. Um, people, if they want, or they could be encouraged to bring their own chairs, we'll have chairs set up. Um, we'll still need people to check in at the, the, the town clerk table and maybe we'll tie some balloons there so people can know where to go. They'll get a, uh, their colored voting tab and then they'll just take it with them or throw it out. Um, the moderator is available. Um, we had the election yesterday and uh, Nat Fortune is the new moderator for Waitley. He is available. The Waitley uh, power couple. Yeah, please. <laughs> Brian, what are we doing as far as remote participation? Um, well, remote participation is not allowed. 
Okay. Um, FCAT does yeah, play live stream it, right? Live stream it. Um, we haven't worked out every detail of how they're getting the Wi-Fi signal, but I think that's a that's a solvable problem. We solved it in Deerfield and Sunderland, and I'm uh, sure they'll be able to solve it in Waitley, either by hooking into the school or by making a Wi-Fi hotspot through someone's cell phone. Um, but uh, that's a that's a solvable problem that I just don't happen to know the details of how they're going to solve it. Yeah. I have a if it if it helps uh, if if this if the school Wi-Fi doesn't reach I have a um, portable wireless uh, ellipsis that I can plug in the passcode and 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 that can be used if if need be. Oh okay, all right. Well, I'll be sure to um, let FCAT know about that as a possible uh, way to manage the, the wireless. Yeah, and we can just take it for a test drive. We should definitely take it for a test drive before. Yeah, I think whatever they do, they're going to test drive before they do it. Yeah. Uh, but they that's, may already have a solution that I'm just not aware of. That's fine. I mean, it's just, you know, obviously a little portable card about this big, and I take okay. it everywhere I go, so. Okay. So, so would we be allowing people to call in and... Yeah, but, but, let me correct myself. Remote voting is not allowed. Right. Okay. Um, I, it's it, it's a whole new it's a whole new idea that people could call in and particip participate, not vote at an annual town meeting. And um, uh, typically, it's not done. It's not something we've done before. I I, I don't know what what the answer is. Presumably, it would be in the discretion of the moderator. Could we have a designated person who, you know, sits on the on 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 the red phone, and when the red phone rings, <laughs> they deliver the question to the moderator, and the moderator asks the question out loud or something. What what have these other two towns done? Do they allow that? I did not see any. Um, oh remote participation in Deerfield. I did not go to Sunderland's, but I went to Deerfield's and it was, you know, like any other town meeting, um, even in the past when we've had that town meeting broadcast, um, we never had a people from home can phone in their questions. Um, so this would be something new. I'm not saying I'm against it, um, but uh, it would be another thing where we need another person to really monitor and run whatever is presumably zoom would be the way that people would get to see it but then somebody's got to manage like the picture there and be pointing the laptop camera presumably at whoever's speaking and it's a sort of another managerial role um i think with fcat broadcasting as a live stream people can probably get a better picture that way um, assuming they've got cable at home. If they don't have cable at home, then that's not an option. Um, but, but, you know, Joyce, I, I do think in, in the, given the number of, of seniors we have, if we can set something up, if a senior is nervous about attending town meeting, or if anybody, I, I don't mean to pick on, on 65 or older, if anyone is nervous about attending town meeting because of health issues, because of COVID, setting something up where if they wanted to ask a question, I mean, unless it's a logistical nightmare, I think it's probably a good idea. We don't want people's health to be at risk, obviously, if they feel like they want to participate. Mm -hmm. You know? I, I, I don't disagree with you. It just, it, it, I'm not saying it's a logistical nightmare, but it is a load. I mean, it is a thing that somebody is going to have to do and set up and manage. And I think all the people on this phone call except for the general public have roles they have to play that night. Um, so I don't, there's no easy answer to who would manage this. And um, the, and, and the, I mean, the legality is that person can't vote. Right. If they're right. right. And I, I don't know if that line would be kind of blurred of people saying, Oh, well I can just, you know, call in by zoom. And, and it's not really the same thing as showing up and voting. Well, um, right. so I, I get that. It, it can also be confusing to people to, to think, oh, I'm gonna participate remotely and then find out they can't vote. 
that's so that's uh, I think that's another potential uh, a potential problem with it. Well, for so anybody is, anybody who's out there watching, if you are one of those people who would be a little skittish about actually coming to town meeting, and you would like the opportunity to ask a question, let's see if we can work something out. Does that make sense? I, I don't want to anticipate problems that don't exist, especially if they're a little bit onerous to solve. But I also want to you know if it's a real problem, then we should take what action we can to to solve it. Let me ask you this: Does and I don't and I always pick on this poor person, and I shouldn't. Um, does Amy have a role at town meeting? No. Somebody better be taking uh, minutes. <laughs> Brian, does Amy have a role? Um, not specifically, no. So if 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 we had, sorry, Amy. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> if, if we had Amy at a table near the moderator with Zoom capability, and if a if a question came across via chat or via whatever method, she could write it down and hand during during the appropriate times. It has to be. You know, if the, if there's a conversation about the you know payment of the fire truck, just using it as as an example, then someone can type in a question, and Amy can hand it to Nat. I, I'm just you I'm make it sound here. like it's really easy to set up, and I don't even know how Amy's going to have wireless out on the field there, and how strong it will be. Well, we just covered that. She's going to have the wireless card right next to her. Yeah. I'm, look, I'm just saying it may not be as straightforward as you say. Right. That's yeah. it. I get that. L yeah. let, me, let me just throw this out. Well, for one, you know, we, cut, we tried to accommodate these people that didn't want to meet in public for voting by mail-in ballot. Brian, how many people actually showed up for, to vote in person? Do you have any idea? Um, somewhere around 25. 25 out of the, what, 200 that total votes around yeah. there yeah yeah okay now is it is it possible is another option here that if we put the warrant articles on our website they will be They'll, they will be there yeah before the meet before the meeting and yep. ask people if they have questions or wish to come in on any of them to send it in or we can read their comments at the meeting can we come can we do it that way Or is that too confusing? Um, I, I, I mean, part of this, part of this is in, I think, in the discretion of the moderator as to yeah. how he wants to run the meeting. And, um, and so many questions are also extemporaneous questions. They're, they're sort of as conversation mm -hmm. iteratively moves forward as opposed to set questions ahead of time. Right, right. And not everybody will know their questions in advance. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess from a from a practical standpoint, some of these articles move pretty quick, and they have in the past, and and I wonder if if there would be a lag between when somebody gets their question typed or communicated, presumably typed, because it's going to be difficult to hear. Um, what happens if we're already voting at that point? Yeah, that's fair. Um, or, or do we have? Oh, or we would have to sort of pause and wait. And um, I don't know. Well, when when FCAT broadcasts this, what I remember, they're they're they broadcast the speaker who's raising the who's reading the Warren article. Now. Would it be better for them to show the Warren article on the screen, even though a person is still reading it, so people, more people could see it? Because otherwise, if you're in person, I guess you get a copy of it and you can read it black and white as well. Would that be a benefit? Um, there was no screen in Deerfield. I don't know that we plan to have a screen in Waitley. Well, no, but for not, not for the, the people 
in the field, but the people at home that are looking at it on their phone or computer, you know, they're going to hear all of us read the question unless they print it out ahead of time. And I guess what I'm saying, like we do here on Zoom, we can show a document on the screen and talk about it. Right. That I can't do that. I think that pre sub if, if we do that, then that's a, you know, whoever's operating it can do a share screen with that document. That's certainly a possible thing to do. I guess I thought the thing we were talking about was more like, should we try to do this at all? We're trying to do a lot of new things all at once. And I, I, I don't, I mean, I don't question that it might be useful for some people, but um, will it be uh, enough people that would be well served by this? And it's potentially, to me, the reason I, I would not want to make um, a, a Zoom link to the town meeting, at least not this time, um, is because it can also be really confusing because we can meet by Zoom, we can vote by Zoom, but the law does not allow people at an open town meeting, who, you know, who are citizens who could vote if they're there, they don't allow for them to vote by remote participation. And I think that particular confusing point is to me reason enough to not have that confusion. Just, we don't need to have it. Um, we're not required by law to have it. Um, it might be nice to have it but we are doing a live stream. Um, FCAT also live streams that at their website. So people who don't have cable TV can actually get it at the website. I forgot about that earlier. Um, I think if people want to come and vote, they have to come there. That's a law. We don't have anything to do with that. We don't have no way that we can change that. And I think we're doing a lot to make the meeting accessible as it is. So I feel like it would be kind of taking on too much. We're already using kind of a new location um, with new you know, tech set up. Um, I, I think I'd rather not put this on uh, our already pressed staff to handle as well in real time. That's, I mean, you guys can vote me out <laughs> or you can like, decide that, no, we want to do this and, and, you know, have set things up with Amy to do it. But I think it's, the cost benefit is too high. Okay. That's just my, my thought. If I think about all the costs, not just money, but people's time and trying to figure out the setup in advance, I think that's too high a cost for the benefit that we don't, you know, what small benefit it might have. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of agnostic on this now. I, I think it's wonderful if we can do it. That being said, I get the logistical challenges. None of us have a lot of bandwidth to figure this out ahead of time to make sure that, that it, it runs smoothly because we don't want it to not run smoothly because that's a, a bigger problem than not offering the solution to begin with. Um, you know, maybe it's just not possible as much as I'd like it to be. Because I do feel badly for the people who just don't want to expose themselves to potential risks. But it's a new norm and we have to we have to adapt the best we can, but sometimes we can't adapt. What what if we go back to to people just having the opportunity to to call in to say Amy that would be on site somewhere and, and relay questions to the to the moderator. To give them at least opportunity to ask questions, maybe not not vote, but with that. I still think we have our hands full, Fred. I think we have our that. hands full and 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 I think you know that's we're we're doing everything we can with social distancing. We're having it outdoors. Uh, we're having it in a field where they can actually sit a hundred feet away from everybody else, pretty much. It's you know we're doing a lot, and it's, I think it's not really practical to have. And meeting will go more slowly, right? If you have to wait each time for questions on any particular article, so I, I just think it's not practical. And I do think that people's patients who are there might start to run thin at some point. 
Okay, let's move, let's move on so we won't do anything as far as uh, remote participation. Uh, we need to finalize, okay, rain dates. Uh, Brian, we should probably look at what the, the next, uh, the consecutive days after this, the 24th and 25th, 26th, I guess, if we need to. Yeah. And, and that would be posted, what, on our website? Or would Lynn make a robocall? How are we gonna inform people? Of uh, the rain dates? Yeah. Uh, the rain dates will be listed on the uh, the meeting warrant. I know, but it actually, if if it, if oh if it's canceled that day, yeah, we can we can put out a call. We'll post it on the website. Um, yeah, yeah. At like what five o'clock by five o'clock decide. I think by three o'clock. Three o'clock. Yeah, we'll we'll need to decide to set up or not. So. Yeah. Because the setup starts uh, for the sound system at three, and if we don't tell the sound guy by three, then he's going to charge us. So um, we've got to we've got to make the decision by three p.m. Okay, so by three o'clock we'll decide, and if there's nothing on our website or no robocall, then it's a go. It's going to be held that day. Yeah. Okay. So it is the 24th, 25th, and 26th. Is that acceptable? Are those acceptable rain dates? I would agree with that. That's the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yes. Yeah. Following. Fine for me, Jonathan. Okay. Okay. Let me just say one thing here. Uh, I did meet with the Quanquat uh, Farms people, their event coordinator, Janelle Wilkins, and she gave me a tour of the other facilities, the patio area, and also their pavilion. Uh, it was a nice facilities, uh, although the, to hold uh, the number we could expect, it may be difficult there, but I uh, just appreciate their their willingness to offer their facilities to the town. I guess uh, that, that was a good uh, good gesture by them. I sent an email thanking them to, to do that, th thanking them for that. Uh, and either they're listening here or I guess they'll find out that we're not using their facility, but but it was, it was very nice. I don't know if anybody's been there for any events. Uh, Brian says he has, but... Uh, outside events, yeah, it was a nice place to, to hold something for a smaller group than what we're anticipating, I guess. So So again, appreciate Janelle and, and, Ad, and Anne's uh, efforts to try to help the town. Okay. Uh, moving on, review, discuss the draft annual town meeting warrant. Do we, how do we want to handle that, Brian? Do we? Um, I can, sh maybe, well, I might be able to share it on the screen. Um, yeah, I've got it up on my other screen here. If somebody could. Oh, would you like me to do it? Either way, it's fine. Okay, I'll share the screen since I have it open there. Um, there we go. Okay, so can everybody see that now? Yep. Okay, great. So we can go through these first ones pretty quick. Um, article one is to hear any hear the reports. Article two is for the town treasurer to borrow money. Um, yeah. Article three, this is actually a new one. Um, and it's probably one, it, it's one that we should continue to do every year and all of our surrounding towns do it. Is it's a blanket authorization to let the select board enter into contracts greater than three years. Um, the Municipal Modernization Act allowed that back in 2016, I think. Um, the general rule is that without this exception, the, the, the select board can't enter into contracts of less than three years. Uh, I mean, of more than three years. So um, I'm recommending that that be included 
Um, Article four is um, to enter into uh, uh, bank accounts, essentially. Um, Article five is a generic authorization to expend uh, federal, state, or private grant monies. Article six are our revolving funds with spending limits. Those are the same, what's proposed is the same as FY20. Um, Article seven, I haven't had a chance to fill this in yet, but this is the salaries or compensation of elected officers. And when I do get, to, when I do get around to filling it, it'll, it'll reflect a 2% COLA over uh, a 2% increase over the ones from the prior year. Or I should say the current year. Um, then article eight will be, that's where we'll insert the enterprise fund budget. Um, this year it's looking like it's going to be uh, $395,679, which is a, a gigantic increase of 123%. But the reason why that um, is so large is that we need to account for the revenue from the water merger, which is the $200,000 that they're planning on collecting as part of the, um, the pump house project to pay off that borrowing. So revenue is going up by 200,000 and expenses are going up by 200,000. So it evens out, but it just shows as a, as a really big increase. That's, that'll just be for this year. Brian, shouldn't that date be July 1, 2020? Yep. Good catch. Okay. I didn't know if the other one said that or not, but okay. No, they all say, um, all the other ones say 2020. Okay. Um, the next one, Article 9, is where we're going to put the town operating budget. Um, so I spent most of the day, well, all of the day today, going back through when, um, changing all the budgets that needed to be changed based on the finance committee meeting last night. Um, and right now, so the finance committee is going to meet tomorrow night as well to finalize this. But what I'm presenting to them, it, it's going to be a total town operation budget of um, $5,252,510. That's a decrease of um, $5,321 from uh, current fiscal year. It's a, a change of uh, a decrease of um, a tenth of a percent. Um, it's a little bit different than what we landed at last night, but that's because there were some um, just some changes that need to be made to some of those budgets, which we can talk about in a second. Um, but that's um, I think what that'll be in the ballpark of of what's proposed. It would, this is very speculative because it, we don't know a whole lot about what we expect to get from the state in terms of aid or um, state and county charges, but it would, it would bring the tax rate down probably approximately two cents. Um, so the idea was is that we would try to keep the town operating budget, which is solely within our control, um, even or a little less than even compared to the current fiscal year, which we have managed to do. Um, so Article 10, Article 10, that's the 200,000 to, to reduce the tax levy. Um, we talked last night and it seemed like the Finance Committee Select Board were both in agreement that we would transfer $100,000 from free cash to general stabilization. So that's where this article that's where this article would show up. Um, it was general stabilization, if I remember right, right? Yep. Yeah. So Article 12, I don't think I don't think we have any more transfers proposed. Um, in terms of capital project appropriations, we're looking at 21,500 in free cash to pay for the 
half of the public safety telecommunications equipment. That's because the both fire department and police department are switching from the, the system run by the Franklin Regional Council of Governments to the state system. And it requires the purchase of new radios for that. This will allow for the, this will fund the, the police to, to totally change over. It'll fund a portion of the fire department. And then the next fiscal year, there'll be a similar article um, to purchase the rest of the, the radios for the fire department. Um, Shouldn't that be fiscal year 20? Free no, cash? it's fiscal year 19 free cash. Because fiscal year 20 hasn't closed yet. We're always spending free cash a year. You're behind, Even, okay, but okay. Yep. And that's not the right. The number that was in the finance committees was 21. Um, Five, uh, yeah, I, I think I got that number. I thought I had that number backwards. Yep. Okay. The next one that was agreed upon was, was repairs to the um, elementary school roof for the, um, to remove the skylights in the cafeteria that have been leaking for years, I believe. Um, the concern there was, is that if it's not, if it's not addressed, it's going to continue to deteriorate the surrounding um, the surrounding areas of the roof and the ceiling in the cafeteria. Mm -hmm. And that was another one from free cash. Yeah. There are more funds. This uh, Article Thirteen though says stabilization, right? Right. Each one of these are different temp, uh, different temp uh, templates. Oh, I see. I see. That I'm filling after. Yep. Okay. So the numbers will probably change, but I'll just put the um, the, the numbers there. Yep. Okay. Um, the next project was to expand and resurface the parking lot and driveway for the library. That's um, twelve thousand five hundred. We think there's a uh, opportunity to, to save costs because Chestnut Plain Road is also being resurfaced this summer. So we'll, we'll avoid costs in terms of mobilization and th that type of thing. Um, the next one that was supported was um, $13,750 to continue the, it's, it's year two of three for purchasing uh, replacement fire hose for the fire trucks. It's, this is a five inch hose that will increase um, the capacity of the department to, to fight fires. Um, it was supported that, that the town um, this would be this would be twelve thousand dollars initial payment, and then for four years after that, through it, uh, we're obligating the first year. We're we're appropriating for the first year um, of a five-year municipal lease to replace the the wood chipper that is currently broken at the highway department. Um, we should make sure that people know that's leased to own. Yep. There's there can be. There can be one or two articles. Um, one article, which requires a two-thirds vote, allows authorizes the authorizes the the town residents authorize the town by a two-thirds vote to enter into the lease purchase. Um, the state treats that as a as a debt obligation under Mass General Law. It's obviously it's something that we can get out of. And we'll just return the equipment and call it even. Um, but we still requires a two thirds vote for um, authorizing the town to enter into that lease. The appropriation itself, the 12,000 requires a majority vote. Um, and while we're talking about municipal leases, um, it was also agreed that there would be a, um, the town would enter into a uh, similar lease purchase arrangement for an excavator for the highway department. And that would be at a cost of um, 
somewhere between 40 and 45,000 per year. And again, that would be for five years. First year needs to be appropriated. I think the plan is to use $35,000 of chapter 90 funds for year one and um, $10,000 uh, from the enterprise fund to fund that first year. Okay, and th that would appear as, again, two articles? Um, yes, there'll be at least two articles. And the reason I say that is the 10,000 that's being contributed from the enterprise fund mm -hmm. was actually the same 10,000 that was appropriated from the general fund to the enterprise fund um, when the pickup was transferred between the enterprise fund and the town. Um, I don't know if we have to, this is a question that I have for council is, is do we on paper need to appropriate $45,000 knowing that we're gonna use chapter uh, 90 funds to pay for it? But I'll have that answer before we finalize the warrant. Okay, so I'll just make a note of that for us. Knowing these numbers are all, the numbers of the articles are gonna change. And on that particular one, it's not coming from free cash. Right, okay. yeah. Um, there was a request from uh, Frontier to do some minor repairs, well, in the grand scheme of things, they're minor repairs to their, um, I don't have it in front of me, intercom system, clocks and something else. Um, it was around 48,000, the whole project. Um, weight we share is $5,500. And that was agreed upon at the last meeting. And the, that would come from free cash. We'll have we'll have the full details in, in the article. And then it was agreed upon that we would pay the final year of the debt service on the fire truck, which is eighty thousand eight hundred ten dollars, and that would also be taken from free cash. In the past, that's been as part of included as part of the tax levy, and taxes were raised to pay that. Um, it was decided that in an effort to keep the tax rate and the tax burden lower on residents this year that we would use some of our existing funds to pay that and this is the final payment so that will be fully paid off. So including Including the transfers, we'd still have a hundred, um, yeah, hundred seventy-eight thousand one hundred eighteen dollars remaining in free cash that um, will be carried over to the next fiscal year, and we'll have additional free cash from FY20. Um, from what we can tell, FY20 was a normally a, a pretty normal year in terms of our in terms of our collections in terms of revenue, so we'll be starting. FY21 in, a, in pretty much a normal financial position. And we'll have to see how, how things go as we go through the year. Again, we can always, going back to the operating budget for a second, we can always, we can always amend the operating budget up or down um, before we set the tax rate in the fall. And in the fall and early winter, it needs to be tax rate needs to be set before the end of December. So we have some flexibility once we see the state aid numbers. If we need to make adjustments, we still can. It would require a special town meeting, but um, the opportunity still exists. This isn't a one-shot deal. And, and I think the idea was for the projects that aren't funded right away, I think the same thing applies in terms of, we just wanna wait and see what those numbers look like um, from the state 
and see what our new free cash number comes in at, see what we get from FY20, and then make some decisions again in the fall time or, or winter time. So, Article 13, that's the one about, did we already do the one with 100,000 in general? Yeah, we did that, right? Um, I don't, I don't know, but 13 was about to pay something. All right, so, we definitely did the 100,000. We did. Right. Well, oh, yes, we did. That was Article 11. Okay. So we're not, the plan right now is to not fund any capital projects with stabilization funds. Um, okay. So our the plan the plan right now is that we'll grow our stabilization by a hundred thousand um, by transferring some into free cash, and we'll we'll wait and see what what happens. But we're in a good we're in a good starting position for sure. So yeah. Uh, so we're deciding not to take any stabilization at this point. Revisions can come later in the year, perhaps, if those state numbers are favorable. Yeah. So I'll just make that italics. So in all likelihood, there's going to be no article with the wording shown here on 13. Right. Okay. Yep. And Article 14 is what I was referring to about um, repurposing the unexpended funds from, and I'll, I'll, get the, I'll get the exact special town meeting date in article number, but it relates to the 10K for the, for the excavator. That's creative spelling. <laughs> uh, the next one is, is a placeholder for, for the authorization for the lease purchase. Now that we know we're doing both of those, we'll have similar articles for both. Okay. So uh, that one does not have a number on it, I don't think. Yeah. Okay. Um, 15 was the 250th asked this to be removed. They removed their request for um, $20,000. Well, will it actually go in there as a removed article or? Um, uh, it'll just be deleted. It'll just be removed. It'll just be removed. Okay. Just there for our discussion. Um, this was the, the, we talked about this one. This is a frontier regional one. The, there we go. Electric corridor holds repairing central clock system and repairing exterior and interior intercom systems. Okay. And then the next articles are CPA articles. Um, the CPA met at five o'clock today, and I, I have an email that I recently received, but I didn't have time to open it yet. I think they want to revise some of these, um, some of the appropriations into the reserves, but I'm not sure. So those numbers are estimates based on what we think, what, what they project the revenue will be. Okay. I'll adjust those. The, I believe the 43000 for the town hall is probably safe um, to pay for the outstanding loan for the historic rehab project. And then Article 18 and the ones below are project specific appropriations. So 18 is for the restoration of gravestones in the town cemeteries. And there's descriptions of all these projects on the on the CPA website. Um, I think this is the third or fourth one for, um, for trying to um, clean up the cemeteries. 
Article 19 is the appropriation of $60,000 of CPA funds for the, what's being called the Waitley Center Woods Project. And there's been a lot of discussion about that um, at the CPA meetings. Um, 20 is um, $10,000 um, to update the town's open space and recreation plan, which is expired. The hope is, is that we can, we'll get another 10,000 from the state, either from through community compact or um, a different grant source to be able to do this. And we would, I think the plan would be to, to engage for COG to help us with this. There's a lot of data and mapping that's required and capabilities we don't have in house. Hmm. Article 21 is for the purchase of an APR. Um, on Long Plain Road, and the one, the one um, underneath it is is also for a purchase of an APR on River Road. In the details of those projects, if people are interested, you can go on the website under the under the Community Preservation Committee, and there's descriptions of the projects there that they can click on. Um, Article 23. So these are so both of these. Both of these are the same. The names are different. It's to allow um, Bill Smith and Gary Stone to continue as firefighters for Waitley. Um, they've reached that magical age where um, they need to get special permission to uh, special permission from the state that says they can be firefighters stuff. Um, I feel like we have these articles every year. Mm, yeah. Brian, going back to, to the other, the APR ones uh, here, shouldn't we have a, a better description of at least a parcel? 20 acres on River Road, I mean, they know the parcel numbers. Yeah, there's those notes that, there's notes to myself right there. I'm going to- the Location, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, the assessor's map. Yeah, okay. Of numbers, yep. Okay. So 23 and 24, those are the firefighter articles. Um, so I talked with Nicholas Jones today a little bit about the, about the need for a home rule petition to dissolve the Whitley Water District as, as sort of the last step of the water merger. Um, the Whitley Water District was created by special act of the legislature, so it needs to be dissolved. It, district needs permission to dissolve itself and um, dispose of all or substantially all of its assets. Um, so I'm working with town council to see what um, what the language is that we need there. I think we should do it. We talked a little bit about whether we should delay it. I'm, I'm concerned if we delay it that this is not going to be at the top, uh, not going to be a top priority of the legislature um, in the who knows how many months. Um, so it might be a while until they, till they get around to addressing this. Um, mm. So, so get the, you quickly. <laughs> so I think the the sooner we get it in and, and get permission, the better. Um, Are there liabilities involved by having it exist and not dissolved? Um, no, I think, but I, I think they need permission anyways to get rid of substantially all of their assets. No, I, I don't think they can make themselves sort of a, a shell corporation, uh, a, a shell entity. Okay. So there will be an, likely be an article about that. One thing that I, that I made a note for myself is if you recall at the, uh, the special town meeting on March 25th, one of the reasons we had that was to transfer a sum of money out of the capital stabilization account to allow us to enter into the contract for the Williamsburg Road Bridge project. Um, we need an article to move that money back into capital stabilization, seeing that MassDOT so generously funded us the, the extra money that we needed. So there'll be an article for that as well. 
Okay. Hey, Brian, uh, is when that money goes back in, was the stabilization number that we were talking about in last night's meeting including that transfer back or not including that transfer back? I, in, the, in the amount that I included, I included it in that amount. You did, okay. Yep. Right. There's not an additional uh, 50,000. Okay. So then we get to everybody's favorite part, bylaws. Um, this is a proposed general bylaw. Um, it's agreed upon by the, the planning board and the um, highway superintendent and um, the historical commission. The law currently requires, well, well the law allows municipalities under the Scenic Roads Act to adopt local bylaws to, to administer the Scenic Roads Act, which Whitley hasn't done yet. Um, it, really, the purpose of this is to, for those situations where it doesn't really make sense to hold a public hearing, um, that those requirements can be waived, it is what they're trying to get at. Um, they just make it a little bit more manageable. It's typically there's a joint public hearing between the between the planning board and the highway superintendent or the I'm sorry the tree warden in in this case. Um, so they put together this bylaw and it's currently being reviewed by uh, town council. Okay. So because it's a general bylaw, it would be a fifty. It would be a majority vote required. Um, and then we have a series of zone, proposed zoning amendments from the planning board. So Article 26, it's, it's, an, it's an amendment that's um, put forth by the planning board, but it's really on behalf of the water department. It's amending the aquifer protection district. Uh, yeah, the aquifer protection district bylaws or the zoning bylaw pretty much mirrors the state regulations, except for um, the local ones are missing what's proposed here as, as paragraph or subsection R. Um, and that says the storage of manure, unless such storage is within a structure designed to prevent the generation and escape of contaminated runoff and leachate. The idea being that within the zone one or zone two water recharge area, it's not good to have a lot of animal, anim, uh, animal manure seeping into the ground. Um, so it's being proposed that that be added. This came to light when, when our engineer for the water merger had discussions with MassDEP about submitting an application to um, mo essentially modify the existing water system by adding on the water district users. And they said, well, you need to have, you need to have, um, regulations in line with what the state has. And we do accept for this provision. So if this doesn't pass, it's unlikely that Mass DEP would allow the merger of the water systems. Okay. So article 27, this is the start of um, proposed amendments for um, for solar facilities. Article 27 is amending the table of use. Um, say 10 kilowatts AC um, on the table of uses. Yep. Um, and I believe that's the only change on the table of use. There's further articles that really talk about more significant changes. Um, so there's there's a lot of changes here. Um, I don't know if we want to get into all of them now. Um, this was reviewed by town council. Um, he had cons and he he made edits and changes concerns about um, the imposition of a of um, 
I forget what it's called, resource resource recovery fee, resource recovery. Resource replacement fee, which is a fee to be paid by the owner or operator of a large scale ground mounted solar facility for removing agricultural or forest land from production. The size of which shall be determined by the select board with input from town agricultural and conservation commissions. He has concerns that that's an unlawful exaction. Um, but the planning board's, um, the planning board's take on it is that they would like to um, keep that in, and if the AG finds that it's not allowed, then the AG would delete it from our bylaw. Um, and there's a series of uh, a series of other um, changes that are made to the bylaw as well. Um, so the way that zoning is typically set up is that that once, once a zoning bylaw goes through the process for the planning board public hearing, um, it goes on the warrant as the, as the, as the, as the, as the planning board presents it and the boards have the ability to recommend or, or not recommend based on uh, what they think about it. I think I already know what Joyce thinks about it. Um, yeah. So I, when, when, and hopefully we can meet Monday, um, when we meet on Monday, that's when we would have to make our recommendation, yay or nay, or no position. I, I don't know what, what the board would want to do, but. Um, to Brian. How will this be handled at the, at the actual meeting? Are we going to vote on each section as changed or it's just going to be the whole bylaw is one? You'd vote by article. Right. If, if there was changes, if there were changes proposed to the text of the bylaw, it would be done by, a, by an amendment from the floor. Okay. So the, the, the solar is one vote, the scenic road is another vote the aquifer protection is another vote but for the solar it's like it, it's like the whole thing or nothing is that uh, right. and with or without amendments i suppose or the way it's written right now it's all or nothing by article right and one article is about the solar right. generation right oh, one, i guess there's, there's another one about the table of use Table use, and then there's one underneath it about definitions. So I'm hoping okay. it definitions are a separate one. Okay. I, I'm. It, it, tell me if it doesn't make sense in the order that 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 is presented. Presumably, that the amendment to the table of use could be done without the subsequent article being adopted. Hmm. My understanding. I think you're right. Um. The much lengthier one. And the definitions that follow it, I think. Um, On here, the definitions are not um, given at, oh, I'm sorry, I just saw them. They, they are as a separate article 29. Uh, okay, understood. Sorry. So I hope that makes sense in the order that they're presented. Because um, if, if article 28 does not pass, I don't think there's a reason to do um, 29. But there may be a reason to do the table of use. Yeah, the table of use is not controversial. It's a clarification. Right. Yeah. Okay, do, uh, do you happen to know if the planning board knows that they'll not have a screen to project things on? As we, when we're indoors at the gym, we usually have a screen and I think there's no uh, plan to have that out in the field. I will let them know.
Does anybody want me to scroll back to any other part of the of the draft warrant? Well, all these articles will be a uh, uh, handout at the site, right? Yeah. Right. And what I usually make a, to accompany this is sort of a town meeting booklet that has explanations of I, items that might be confusing or controversial. Okay. That's that's in hopes that we limit discussion and therefore limit the time that we're that we're there. Okay, any other discussion on the annual town meeting warrant? No, okay, well, let's move on. Uh, next item is the CARES Act funding and reimbursement update. Yep, so as you know, we have earmarked 139,000 for Waitley. Um, I should say thank you to the town of Deerfield who's agreed to pay for um, who's agreed to pay for the breakfast that Frontier has been providing to the South County Senior Center for all residents of Deerfield, Waitley, and Sunderland. Um, thank you, Deerfield. So thank you. Um, so the deadline for submission was June 5th. It got extended to June 12th. Um, what we have in total for costs to submit for FY20 right now is $42,000. Um, a big chunk of that is the, is the desire of the school to purchase $20,000 of Chromebooks um, with the idea that there may be some distance learning component in the fall. Um, another 8,000 of that, 8,000, 9,000 of that is estimated for um, costs from the Board of Health, the contract with the um, Northampton Public Nursing Program. Um, they're in place to do um, the help with contact tracing if there are any um, cases, which I think we've been pretty good. Um, I don't think our numbers have gone up very much. Um, So that'll leave us. So if that's forty-two thousand. That'll leave us with with just under a hundred thousand for um, FY twenty-one. Uh, I, I also asked for estimates from um, from some folks in terms of what they might expect for FY twenty-one, and um, I was a little bit concerned about co potential costs from the board of boards of health to continue the con to continue with the Northampton Public Nursing Program in terms of con uh, contact tracing. Um, I think we just, I think we or I just need to make sure that there's good communication that people aren't assuming that CARES Act money is available and they just go out and enter into contracts or um, make purchases that um, are either not eligible or we don't have money for. Um, from what I've seen from the we're starting to get leaks out about what restrictions might be in place for the fall time to, um, to return to in-class learning. Um, it, it, quite honestly, it makes me really nervous that, we're, that we may have some significant costs. Um, right now, a lot of our classrooms are set up on, at, for table learning. I think most of our classrooms have tables in them. Um, from what I've heard from the principal, the, there might be the need to purchase desks to get kids separated. Um, if there's low class ratios, we may need to use the cafeteria as additional classroom space. We may need to use the gymnasium as additional classroom space. Um, and thankfully, I, I think the elementary school, you know, has that space available. I can't even imagine what other school districts who don't have space um, to separate out these classes are going to do. Um, there's a, there's a call with Darius and the four town administrators on this coming Friday. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, about what, what that looks like and what they're hearing and in, in what that might be in terms of costs. But we'll have to sort of keep our eye on that. 
but 140,000 seems like a lot of money. 139,000 seems like a lot of money, but it also seems like not a lot of money if we're going to have to make some significant purchases. So that's where we are with, with CARES Act funds. Okay, moving on to old business to discuss community outreach for the municipal aggregation program. Yeah, since since our last meeting, we've we've received um, the information from Colonial Power, the outreach material. Um, there's a town specific press release. There's we have copies of the consumer notification material that's going to be mailed out. Um, and there's there's different iterations of of outreach material. And I guess and there was talk about maybe having material available at the annual town meeting or having somebody talk about it at the annual town meeting. I don't know if we still, if that's something we still wanna do. Um, from what I can tell from, from the notification material that, that's been sent out, it looks like July 15th, July 15th, 2020 is the, is the opt out deadline, um, which means that, and I emailed um, Denise Allard today, I haven't heard back, um, which means that the material must be getting mailed out fairly soon because it's a 30 day opt out period. But I asked her to, to know when that is. I, I thought we had definitely decided to have some level of a presentation. But now that I think about it, I don't know how we do that presentation without a screen at town meeting. I thought um, the presentation was going to be not at town meeting, but at a public forum. Were we going to have we were going to have something at town meeting? Maybe literature available? Yeah, I think literature would be good, but I don't. I think we're no, we're trying yeah. not to tax the agenda too much at the town meeting because we really want to get it done before it gets dark, or before the mosquitoes come out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and there's no screen, so we and you need a screen, so yeah, never mind. I, I didn't say that. So we'll have so we'll have some type of handout material then that that could be picked up. Um, are we thinking we're still going to do? Um, there was the Waitley specific press release. Are we still going to do that through the through the Scoops bulk mailing license? Uh, we can. Um, I guess I think if the Energy Committee wants to do it, it'll be a really low cost sort of thing to do. And I think that um, that it can be done in pretty short order. Um, so I, I would certainly, uh, as scoop editor, I would cooperate with that. Um, but I would probably let the energy committee sort out the content. Okay. I think uh, the press, the Waitley specific press release, the uh, chair of the energy committee uh, made a few changes to it. I mean, not, not, not big changes or anything. Um, but uh, the wordsmithed it a little bit. So, and I think everybody on the energy committee and maybe on the slug board got copies of that as well. Okay. Would it, would it be useful to, to have a, I guess you call it a, a Zoom uh, information meeting on this to present a quick overview and ask people to comment if they want or ask questions before the, before the annual town meeting? I don't know that it has to be before the annual town meeting, but it should certainly be before the opt-out date. Well, Not the night before the opt-out, maybe. You know, give some people some time so that they understand the options that might be. Well, I guess that's something to consider. Well, you, we've got, what, two weeks? Well, only two weeks to, to the annual meeting, yeah. Well, could it, could it be something that's after annual town meeting, but before the opt-out date? If it's a Zoom meeting, we don't necessarily have to worry that much that people are traveling, but we'd probably avoid July 4th anyway. Right. Um, and uh, there, I think there's probably plenty of time between the 4th and the 15th. Um, earlier, probably better. 
that we could find a date for a, a, a you know a Zoom information session. I think uh, I think that's probably uh, really uh, a good thing for the energy committee to do the planning on. So maybe I don't know when their next meeting is. Okay. So we'll wait to hear from the energy committee how they want to do how and if they want to do that. Yeah, yeah, they may need to have a short meeting to set some dates and things like that, make some decisions. Okay, uh, I read most of what was presented there. I didn't look at it all. It got kind of lengthy. Uh, yeah. The the I guess question I had. Okay, I understand you have the thirty days to. To opt out by what July 15th once you opt out you can't get back in for what three years is that true I don't know I don't think so yeah because the because you're buying into a set price right so you, you I think they're gonna probably be two you could opt out initially in July, and then I think you might have another opportunity to opt in for January 1st when the rates change for the three-year duration. We should check, we should follow up on that and find out. Yeah. Oh, and and kind of and related to that, if you if you take the default value or you pick any option and you want to change to another option does it let you do that at any time either up or down on an option I can't imagine it does I don't think so no I also I, I think the answer to the previous question now that I think about it a little bit it, I, I, I don't imagine the answer is yes that you can't um, get back in once you Opt out. Like if you if you if you opt out, then you may have limited opportunities to opt in at a later date. But but you know my message, Fred, to anybody who's who's on the fence, is stay in the program. If at any time you don't like it, I mean, can't you opt out? You can opt out leading up to July first. July fifteenth. July no, but the second the second go around. You can, uh, there's an opt out window at the end of the year as well. We need to check. Yeah, I don't do. know what the, op, like yeah. other times when you can opt out, I don't remember the details of that. Yeah. So we should definitely, cause that's a, that's a question that's gonna come up. So we need an answer to it. Because what may enter into it is, when does say uh, Eversource set their, their new rates? Every six months. Every six is that a calendar basis, six months? Yeah. So if they're going to set them in, in January or December, then maybe people would want to, I guess, stay until then and decide whether to continue or to opt out, right? See, I don't think that's you get, that you can just opt in, opt out, opt in, opt out, like in real time. I think that's kind of the whole point. Right. Because you're buying a commodity. You're, on the, on the frequently asked questions, it says, you may leave the community choice power supply program at no charge and be placed on your utilities basic service with choosing another supplier on your own. Opting out is easy. You may fill out the opt out form. If you participate initially and then choose to leave the community choice power supply program, you may return only if accepted by the competitive supplier and at prevailing market rates. So you don't have access to the rates that are negotiated at this point. So you can't go, you can't come in and out, can't come in and out, can't come in and out. But, you can, but it sounds like you can leave whenever you want to. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's uh, question, uh, answer 12 on the frequently asked questions. Right, yeah, I think I saw something like that, but yeah. All right, well, the Energy Committee will meet soon. We will be meeting soon, so. Okay, so they'll let us, let Brian know what's happening. Yeah. 
So new business now, Fred? Maybe? Okay, new business. Uh, discuss the need for additional storage space at the highway garage due to the mandated closure of the mezzanine storage area by the Department of Labor Standards. So if you recall, we had a, we had an inspection from BLS at the highway garage. And there was seven or eight, I think seven or eight items that needed to be addressed. And we've addressed all of them except um, using the mezzanine storage area. Uh, that's that's the the makeshift area above the office space that's they use that the highway department uses to store equipment that they're not using seasonal equipment and supplies. And um, right now they access it through a regular ladder. Um, there's no railings. There's there's it's just open, um, which is a problem. Um, so OSHA regulations say that, or DLS regulations, which are the same as OSHA now, um, that we need to put in an OSHA compliant either ladder or stairs. We need to, um, or we need to put in railings throughout. So this, the mezzanine is, mezzanine is access on both sides. So we need to do this on both sides. Uh, we would need to put up railings at um, a certain height and block that area off, which it, it's possible to do. But long term, I have concerns about us moving supplies up and down ladders um, from a workplace safety standpoint. And um, I was talking with Keith about it, and he thought possibly it might make sense to buy one of the large storage containers or shipping containers. Um, yes, the prices that, he, that he's looking at is probably around three or $4,000. And it would be used for outside um, waterproof storage. So he could store all the stuff that's up there and we could close off that area or, or just not use that area. And that would satisfy um, ELS. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Is this um, stuff that could not be stored inside some of the unused space at Fort Sandy Lane? Um, yeah, I think it's stuff that, that you don't really want to store it indoors in a place where you're, you know, conditioning the air and people are, you know, recirculating and breathing. Um, right. I, I have not seen this mezzanine or the things that are on it. So I, I'm just asking out of complete ignorance um, with the material. If it's a problem that the materials are things that you shouldn't be storing in a place where people are working, then um, an outdoor container like that makes perfect sense. And it would also be less convenient for them to have to go to Sandy Lane every time they do. Yeah. But what I remember seeing the, the space, I, I didn't actually go up there, but I, I think there's a lot of, say, hand tools up there, the small plumbing and, and hardware items, nothing major. But we also, speaking of storage spaces, we also have the yellow barn by the cemetery in the center of town. And I think that that is owned by the Historic Society or Historic Commission, one, one of the two. It's owned by the town. Pardon? It's owned by the town. It's owned by the town, okay. Yeah. And I think Keith has stuff in there already. He moved stuff from the storage barn we had behind the town hall. Yep. Isn't there room in there for what else he wants to store in there? Why, why can't that be used? I, I guess that's a question for him. Um, mm. Is it secure enough there? Like if you're storing tools and things like that, would that really be something that you can you know, lock up so that you know, tools don't lock away, that sort of thing? Well, it is locked now. Parts of, well, it's right. capable it of being locked up. That securely, right? For like small items, security is a little different than if it's you're storing a tractor there. I, I don't know. I've seen locks on the doors, uh, and I guess I've also been able to open the doors and look inside. Yeah, well, so, if you can do that, I'm not sure how secure the building is. Yeah, yeah but I mean, it, possibly it can be made secure. It's not in an open field where there's no security and gyms people go by it every day probably. But. Right. But could it could be made secure 
for less than four thousand dollars and then um have the inconvenience of having to go all the way up there for a hand tool um or is there a way to store the hand tools someplace else in the in the garage in the highway garage i guess not if they haven't sorted out a way to do it now so let me get more information from Keith. um he couldn't make the meeting tonight i think he was planning on it but he couldn't make it so um hey, brian yeah just, just to add a couple points that that yellow barn is a barn it's just a dirt floor um so there's not much weatherproofing for the things that Keith needs and i think in, in addition to tools tools tires vehicle parts things like that that they don't necessarily use all the time um but i know just seeing the stuff that's up there and over the years um i know it's something that you probably need to have access to nearby instead of having to get in a car and drive across town to, to get it because it, it, there are things up there that they use they use often so it's not just plain old storage yeah mm -hmm. i guess I would like to know what size of this container you're talking about. I guess find out what, what size he's looking at. Most of them are feet, I think. There's, there's a, I, think, I think he's talking about like the standard shipping containers. Yeah, like a 20 foot container. So 20 feet long by what? Five by five by eight high or something? Five wide, six wide, eight high? I yeah, it's, it's like what you would see on a tractor trailer truck, that type of. Mm. And is this a, a purchase or a lease? It would be a purchase. Is that the kind of thing that's handy to have around? <laughs> okay, so we'll find out more in the next, yeah. our next meeting. Okay, moving on. Uh, discuss locations of the town for vehicle speed studies offered by Franklin County Council of Governments. Speed and re noise reduction efforts in the center of town are, are one concern. And I think Brian or Keith proposed what three locations, three, ro three roads that I've seen uh, to respond to FERCOG. And uh, I guess we need to discuss the specific location on each road, Brian. Uh, it, so this was a, an unexpected email from FERCOG offering to do. I guess with part of their transportation funding, it, it didn't make sense for them to do um, traffic counts because it's not representative of, well, what's always not representative of what the future is going to be. Um, but they offered to do uh, vehicle speed studies. So I emailed it to, to Jim and Keith. And I mean, the places that I've heard are, are River Road, um, Chestnut Plain Road, and Haydenville Road. Um, Maybe somewhere near the bottom of the hill. I don't. I don't know if that makes sense. Um, this is going to sound biased, but I don't know how many. I, I didn't see uh, the road, huh? coming down that hill. People fly. Where are you talking? Coming down the hill on Swamp Road by the bridge. In a gray SUV. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there, there isn't one road in town that people don't speed frequently on. Um, but I, I agree. River Road, uh, Chestnut Plain Road, and Haydenville Road are the road we get the roads we get the most complaints about. That Long Plain Road road would probably be next after that. Um, mm -hmm. Well, those are also. But Jim, is it fair to say those you get more complaints because those are the roads that more people live on? So naturally, you're going to have those those numbers. But you lived on Swamp Road. It's, yeah. it's the it's the major thoroughfare. Going, going to and from Amherst and Hadley. I agree. People I agree. Fly. Yeah. And those people are coming from Haydenville Road and Chestnut Plain Road largely. That's, yes. That's definitely true. Yeah. So should we offer those locations or? Well, what, what are, are they asking? Is there a specific number of locations, Brian? It didn't mention. Didn't mention it. Okay. Oh, Typically, not. in in the past, when we've done traffic studies or anything like that, um, they would get a hold of us to to set things up, and we would kind of point out the 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 best location. So I don't know that a location needs to be voted on, so to speak. Is once they get to the point where they're going to be setting stuff up, then they would contact us. So um, 
we could probably find those the best places for those. Well, if they'll let us do four, I don't object to adding Swamp Road. Um, I, I mean, I, maybe it's rotating. I don't. I don't know. You know, you know, Christian Lane people fly on Christian Lane too. Yeah. Right, and I think the the nice thing about having the Haydenville Road and Chestnut Plain Road is because those are the two roads that feed into people who will either cut over to Yankee Candle on on Christian Lane or Swamp Road. Um, for heading up to 116 over to the other side of the river. Um, so it uh, sort of putting putting one in both places, it might be a little duplicative, not duplicitous, duplicative, uh, but um, having, having said that, people don't always, well, anyway, uh, you know, there's two, a different, two different sets of situations, so someone speeding in one place might not speed in another or vice versa. Well, that's what I was just going to say. It is a speeding study and typically people that are speeding through the center of town on Chestnut Plain Road, they're going to hit Swamp Road and do the same thing. They're going to hit Christian Lane and do the same thing. So they don't, they don't just slow down because they get to Swamp Road and go do, right do, do they speed up because it's less, less, less uh, dense? Sometimes they do, yeah. You know, we, we, sometimes we get people on Haydenville Road and we, we try to catch up to them. And by the time we catch up to them, they're already going 55, 60 miles an hour down Swamp Road. And we can't catch them until the end of Swamp Road or sometimes on 5 and 10, depending. They just accelerate all the way through. Yeah. Well, I, I think since people recently have complained about Chestnut Plain Road in the center of town, that that should be one location yeah. for sure. Uh, yeah. I don't know which it's side of the... South of the center of town because... I think there's more likely to, I mean, the, the, I mean, once you get to the center of town, it feels a little more crowded, but I think it's the problem actually starts outside of there. Um, maybe uh, where the houses are not so close to the road and where it's a little more spread out, but there's still a speed limit there. So I, I guess I would leave it to someone else's judgment as to the actual best location. I can uh, email Jim the the name of uh, someone who lives on there who would be happy to have as something about speeding done and right in front of his own house. So if you, <laughs> I don't, I don't feel like I want to like announce it on the no, this is not. I'm sure I've seen. heard from them as Okay, so should we leave it up to our chief to uh, coordinate with, I, I guess, Keith and Furcock and, on locations? And well, I guess Brian, you need to respond, right? To well, we need to respond with the form, and I'll I can those roads, and I'll say to contact Jim. Okay. Yeah, I have I have recently been in contact with him because we did the the traffic count in front of um, the park and ride, and on Christian Lane going um, onto five and ten, both north and south. So we we did a recent traffic study there as well, so I, I have contact with them. And they, they said they were gonna be reaching out um, okay. because we're more than happy to, they're more than more than happy to send down the counters and do whatever we need to do. They, they have the people for that, so they like the work. Okay, let's move on. Uh, okay. Discuss and vote on a new contract for the Waitley Chief of Police. So as police liaison, I can um, let you know, I know you didn't get the the actual copies by email until just a little while ago, so you might not have had a look at them. But I can tell you, I think you guys did a good job on the last um, contract. I believe we changed um, one word in the contract and we changed the salary number. Uh, the one word that we changed was, I think the um, the section related to um, activities for community outreach uh, refer to a plan and uh, we basically change one word to make this be an ongoing thing so that every three years we take a look at that plan and revise it so by changing that one word to um, I can't remember the word was changed to renew or to ongoing or something like that um, it basically it commits us, the Board of Selectmen, to work with Jim within the month of July 
to come up with um, a revised or updated uh, community outreach plan. Uh, so that's not, I don't think a change of substance, but just a, um, a mark that that was probably a, a nice successful thing and we wanna continue that. Um, the other change was to increase the chief's salary um, to what the personnel committee would have recommended had they been making a recommendation. Um, their study of the towns we compare ourselves to uh, kind of showed them as being about 2% below the average for comparable towns. Um, so um, we thought, well, let's um, raise it to uh, by 2% and it brings them right to the average. Uh, it might be 2.0. We did something so we get right to the average and it's uh, 2.0 something percent. Um, the other, there's a, something peculiar about the way the contract is written that the salary number we put in there is his salary in the first year. And then he gets a call it in the second and the third year, whatever everybody else in the town gets. But it's written such that that first year, he doesn't technically get the COLA unless we put it into the salary. So the number that actually would go in uh, would be more like 4% above the current salary because I mean, I'm assuming everybody else is gonna get that 2% COLA in the town and it doesn't seem like a good idea to start off with being, oh, okay, oh, now we're 2% behind again. <laughs> So uh, to just, you know, get things up to where we want them to be, um, you know, not above average, not significantly below average. We want to uh, get the salary in the right place. And that would do it by putting in a 4% increase where 2% is the adjustment to get a salary in line with our comparison towns. And the other 2% is the COLA that everybody else is going to receive but he would not because of the wording of the contract in his first year. So that I can tell you is the only, th those are the only changes made from last year, or uh, from last time around three years ago. Okay. So I don't know if there's any discussion that people, or did I uh, miss anything, uh, Brian or Jim, that anybody wanted to point out? Okay, but I think the, the last contract we discussed, for, not for Jim, I think it was Brian, we set a salary for the first year and we did not include the 2%. It was not eligible for the 2% or whatever the cost of living was. That was, it didn't start until year two. Is that correct, Brian? Um, well, I looked at it as being included in the, I mean, I looked at it as being included in the amount that was negotiated. It was negotiated right in year one. so. I guess I'm thinking that maybe we should be doing that for Jim as well, what we agree on for year one. No, but Fred, it is the same process that we took with Brian. I mean, I did Brian's contract and it's the exact same process. The, the, number, the, the number that was settled on reflected the reality that he would get X percent in coal increase anyway. Just, just, just like Jim says here, that's been negotiated with Joyce. Right, but he didn't get the cost of living that first year. It, it was included in the amount we agreed to. Right. The salary, okay. But I hear Joyce saying we're agreeing to his Jim's salary now, plus he's going to get cost of living like everybody else. Only in the second and third years. He won't get the cost of living in the first year. So okay, uh, well that's that's different than I I heard a few minutes ago. Okay, sorry, maybe I wasn't very clear. Okay, so the the salary that you're negotiating with him now is is based on the averages of surrounding communities, and that will be the salary that will be for this first year. Mm hmm. Going for, going forward, and cost of living will apply to years, future years two and three. Correct. I, I'm fine with it. I, I, I'm fine with the salary. I think basing it on weighted av or averages is an incredibly flawed system. 
um, that should be thrown out a long mm -hmm. time ago. But, yeah, but democracy. Like said, I'm kind of flawed flawed system. <laughs> I say democracy, incredibly flawed system. But it's it's just, I'm, fine with, I'm fine with the salary. I just don't like the average piece because it's by definition inflationary. Right. But I think it's a great contract. Okay, so do we, need, do we need to take any action on this, Brian? So just to be clear, the amount that would be listed on the contract for year one is going to reflect a 4% increase. Correct. Right. And then future years, so fiscal year 22 and 23, will adjust based on the COLA. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Now, how are you getting it? What's the 4%? I thought it was 2% 2, 2 was the, the, the average of other communities and you're adding 2% COLA. The median. It, mm -hmm. It's 2% to get them in line with the median of our comparable communities yeah. and 2% COLA. Can, can we just use the term that Oh, in the contract, it only has the term, this is the salary. This is the salary. I'm, I'm explaining to you how we came to that number. Right. I, I right. don't care how we came to that number. Oh, Fred does. Well, it, it, part of the rationale is that if we just did 2%, we're either bringing them in line and we're going to be 2% below next time we do the, next time we do the salary survey. Um, or it's like he's not getting a COLA or he's not getting, you know, an, any increase. Or, or, or equitable treatment among our employees. I guess to me, that's the more important thing. If nobody else is getting a COLA, hey, Jim, sorry, you wouldn't be getting that. You wouldn't be getting the same kind of a, of a, a tweak on a salary. Um, but I think it's a matter of being equitable. You know, there are other uh, people in town who we learned, oh, hey, their salary is out of line. So we make a salary adjustment. It doesn't mean they don't get a COLA, they still get a COLA as well. Cost of living still goes up for people. And if the salary was out of line, well, shame on us. We fix that though. And we don't say, oh, you got that thing fixed, so we're not gonna do a COLA. So I think this is a matter of just being equitable with all of our town employees as, as, as much as we can, right? So then if they, is the, the COLA won't be a separate warrant article, it'll be just part of the operating budget, right? Yeah. Right, so it won't come up at annual town meeting as an item of discussion, or will it? It will not. I doubt it, I highly doubt it. It's not a separate article or anything like that. People could ask so, whether we're giving it, but it would have to be a question from the, from the meeting floor. Okay. Okay, so it, it depends on how you word it. You're given the, the cola included and you put it in there it's or not gonna be you, worded that way in the contract. The contract just specifies the first tier salary. I'm telling you how we came to the number that we're right. using for that first year salary. I understand. Okay. We just use a rationale that would be equitable okay. with how we treat our other town employees. Okay. Okay, so Brian, what, what else do we need here? Do we need a vote on this or? Um, if you're comfortable uh, measuring into the agreement, then, then, then that would be good. I, uh, at the very least, I, I need to know what the budget number is. Um, which we'd essentially need to agree on, on what the salary is because that's what needs to be appropriated at town meeting. Um, and that needs a vote? It would need a vote, yeah. Do you but, happen to have the number handy for the salary? It was uh, in an email I know, so you must have it handy somewhere. Yep, my calculation is 71,966 and 10 cents. You want the 10 cents, Jim? <laughs> Are you kidding? Say the number again, please. 71, nine, and I. Can... 
Sorry, I heard 71.9 and I think the last two digits. Six, six. Six, six. Okay, so I'll make a motion that we um, use the number 71.966.10 cents for the chief salary for the new contract Second. that we're uh, trying to enter in. Second. Okay, roll call vote. Uh, Joyce? Uh, yes. Jonathan? Yeah. Fred, yes. Okay, and we'll, you'll give us till the next meeting to look at the, there was two parts of the contract. Wasn't there an amendment as to what he would be actually doing? Uh, we actually have a little more time on that um, agreement regarding community outreach. Uh, so the language in the contract just changes that you know, to an ongoing process. Uh, that's the thing we have to agree on soon and sign the contract. Then that puts us in the position for July is when we have to have the discussions about what should be in that uh, agreement about community outreach. Now, I think Brian sent everybody last year's, so we have some time to think about it before July. But that I think July is the time frame for really making that document and making any changes or updates to it. Does that make sense? So we have time to look at that document. Oh, yeah, we have lots of time to look at that document. Okay. Okay, are we done with this item? Okay, moving on. Uh, discuss and vote to enter a new lease with new pro for the space at the town offices. I got nothing. You can pass over that. Yeah. I emailed them. I haven't heard back yet. Okay. You're waiting for a response from them? Yeah. Okay. And that starts July 1? Yeah. The lease, the lease expires June 30th. The lease expires. Okay. So that'll be on an uh, agenda for our next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Town administrator updates. So Fred. If, if, sorry for interrupting. I I just wanted to say thank you. I I did, but I realized I was muted. So I just wanted to thank you guys for um, for the contract information and thank you, Joyce, for working on that. Okay. But thank you for your hard work too, Jim. Okay, Brian. Um, community outreach meeting for um, DMCTC um, is June fifteenth. Um, and I'll, um, this will be posted on the website because it's a, it's a virtual Zoom meeting. Um, that's Monday, June 15th at 6 p.m. Um, I'll put that on the website. I think I forwarded it to you guys. Um, that's for the proposed marijuana cultivation at Seven River Road. Um, and I'll send that out to all the boards and committees and departments as well. If you recall, those are the, the gentlemen who joined us. Yeah. So, um, okay. They had places where you could sign up for um, a visit to the site. I lost track of that email, but I'm sure I can find that. Yeah, that was, they had set a date. I think the date was May 30th. Oh, and I think I missed that. Right. <laughs> um, I don't know, I, I wasn't able to make it. Um, I suggested to them that they may wanna make the same opportunity available for abutters at some point. Um, and they said that that's something that they would try to do. Okay. Um, and I know um, we still have a, a host community agreement that they've submitted that, that I need to make time to review. Um, so that's, that's that date. Um, so we also had an email, I think it went, I think it went directly to um, some of the board members about concerns from folks on the Williamsburg side of Williamsburg Road, the bridge project. And um, I don't think this is news to anybody that, that um, some folks enjoy the, um, the road being closed and they use it for outdoor recreation. Um, mm -hmm. so I, um, I don't really know where to go with this. 
Um, but there's those feelings across the town line that people would rather see it stay close. Um, How many years have we been doing this? We've been through two town administrators since then. Yeah. And it just, I feel like this is just way too little too late. Like, it, it, I think we've been very public about it. I think I remember the early meetings, the people who live in Waitley on the other side of the road do mind making a 20 minute detour um, every time. And I, I just think it's too, we, I, I, I would have a real hard time rallying any energy behind uh, undoing all the work we've done on getting that bridge replaced. That's my own feeling. I, I mean, I, I'm not completely unsympathetic, but I, I think, you know, 10 years out from when we started working on getting that bridge fixed is, is way too late for people to be saying we shouldn't be doing this. Yeah. And, Go ahead, Fred. I'm sorry. And I think uh, that's one individual in Williamsburg that's writing to Paul. Uh, we've got other ho other property owners in Whaley that, mm -hmm. that, that need access to the property and, and, and need their road there. And I guess if Williamsburg people are not happy with the road, they can close the road in Williamsburg if they want. Why don't they ask the Williamsburg selectmen to consider closing the road if they're that unhappy with it? Yeah, that 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 could certainly be the, something that would solve their problem, and let the people in Waitley be able to access it from Waitley. Right. Well, and, it, and and the reality is, it's also a public safety issue, and I don't think that anyone should minimize the importance of public safety for people who are using the, those those lands up there. If something catastrophic were to happen up there, it would be tough to, to, to serve those people. And well, I've said enough. Oh, that's true. That's true, Jonathan, because as it is right now, if there's a fire call at, at one of the, um, I don't know if you want to call them cabins, buildings, houses, um, there's three of them up there. Um, if there's a fire call up there, then uh, Williamsburg gets notified because it takes Waitley so long to get around. Um, that they just wouldn't be able to get there in time for, for a fire or an emergency. Right. So take, take, you know, a heart attack, you know, scams. It, it, it just, yeah. It's a very long way around if you've ever had to, to get there quickly, which I've had to do a number of times. It, it's not fun for sure. <clears throat> and we, we frequently get people that try to go down that road and they either get stuck turning around or they, you know, they drive off the road and they get themselves stuck. So trying to get tow trucks in there and it is very difficult. I, I don't think we should do anything. I, I guess the letter wasn't written to the select board or, or town administrator. It was a request, to, I guess, to Paul. Yeah. Paul wants I to respond. The letter today was addressed just to me. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was very similar to the others. Um, um, they, uh, the, the ask is that they sincerely hope I will look into this issue with vigilance and make bold steps to preserve water and wildlife for future generations. And, um, I, I guess I'm not necessarily inclined to make bold steps at this. It's not just the 11th hour, it's the 11th hour and 59 minutes. Okay. Yeah. I guess I wasn't aware that the letter came to you, so. Yeah, and this one just came like a couple of hours ago. Okay. Um, and uh, I got, I think the Paul forwarded that other one uh, as well, of course. But I think he, uh, I thought everybody got that one. Yeah. Well, maybe you could respond and say we, we already committed to yeah, I, something. Yeah, I didn't know exactly how to respond to it, but I knew it was going to come up on tonight's agenda, so I thought I'd just wait until until, I mean, I wasn't expecting that you and John would have a, a lot of sympathy either for someone wanting us to not fix a bridge so that our residents still have to go through their town. And that's, um, yeah, but I wanted to check and we're an open meeting, so that's a good place to check. Okay. Okay, anything else, Brian? 
Um, I don't think so. <clears throat> and may I move to adjourn? I got I got one quick quick thing here. Uh, I think some of you know that I've been asking about the the Whateley Center Woods project on on Chestnut Plain Road about more information on the costs from, from uh, CPC. Uh, I did reach out to, to them and they responded, uh, one of their members, uh, Scott Jackson responded saying that if I or the town, I guess, wanted a, wanted a, a Zoom presentation on the project showing the a map of the locations, the the, the details of, of the of the of the project, uh, the funding, the funding. I think what he told me is a little different than what's in the Warren article. I, I may be wrong, but uh, Scott offered to make a presentation, at least to me, and I, I guess I'd like to know if anybody else is interested in that. I've looked at stuff on a website on CPC. I think I have enough information to to make a, a decision at the on the Warren article. I don't know, John, Jonathan, or Joyce, if you feel you want to get a presentation from Scott. Well, I'll I'll jump in there. First of all, Scott's not a member of the CPC. Okay. So let's be clear about about where he sits. Okay. Um, he is not a member of the Community Preservation Committee. Okay. Um, I sit on the Community Preservation Committee. Right. And I am very comfortable with the money that's being spent uh, for the benefit of open space preservation and making Waitley a destination for walkable landscapes uh, and 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 furthering our collective interest in, in being a community that, that, that believes in this kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, the, the money is there. Um, the CPC is incredibly diligent about making sure that it's three pools of money um, are spent appropriately and have the necessary funds available and aren't spending so much money that ex it excludes future money being spent on other projects. So I, I, I'm, I'm completely comfortable with it. And, and we, there have been meetings about this. There have been public hearings about this. So, I, you know, I'm fine. And I would encourage everyone else to be fine about it. Joyce? I was really at the uh, meeting, they um, had uh, called an informational meeting and it was given by the, mostly by the folks from the Kestrel Land Trust who are doing the organizing. And, you know, they have all the information. Um, and I think uh, there were a lot of people at that particular meeting. Um, so I know a lot of people are really well informed about it. Um, I don't know, uh, there may have been other meetings that I, that I didn't catch, but I did catch at least one meeting. This is while in-person meetings were still allowed. Um, back in February, and I agree with everything uh, John said. Uh, the project is extremely well organized um, and uh, conservative in their financing. So I think, uh, and I, I agree about making that, make, keeping that land available for walking in the woods is going to be a big plus for Waitley. Um, you're, it seems like you're saying, well, I didn't hear about those meetings or I didn't know about them or I didn't go and, and I want more information. So maybe other people are like you and they may want more information. Um, I would not object to there being another information session, but um, you also mentioned a whole bunch of other places where the information is available. And in those places, if you have any questions, you can email or call. I think that information is also available. So I don't know how worthwhile it would be to make Scott or anybody else from the Castro Land Trust do another presentation on Zoom for people, unless you think there's a really a good size audience for it. Um, I mean, do you know lots of people who who 
are unaware of what's going on or have questions about what's been uh, posted either at CPC or any of the other places where information is posted. To me, I mean, I, I guess I don't really object to having another meeting as long as I don't have to do anything. <laughs> but um, I, I also question the necessity of it. Well, okay, just so you're aware, the CPC actually trimmed down the request from the Castro Land Trust that was presented to the committee. Um, so from a fiduciary responsibility perspective, the CPC took a number of factors into account when it decided what it would be comfortable with suggesting to town meeting. Um, so, you know, it, I just, and, and those meetings that Joyce referred to, they were very well attended and, and, and the land abutters who had some serious concerns about impact to their properties, they all have had their concerns fully addressed. And I think each of them are very comfortable with the, the, the structure of the, of, the, of the negotiations and how this is being set up, both from a financial perspective and from, a perspective, from the perspective of making sure that there's no harm done to their own quality of life on their you know, home footprint. So there's been a lot of work involved here. It's not, it's not something that happened with one meeting and, and, then, and then we all raised our hands. I mean, there was a lot of meetings around this. Okay. Uh, but I have a question if I, if I could jump in for a sec. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Um, do, do you know um, how many, I don't know if it's miles or how many trails are going to be in there? Is that part of the plan? Because I, I don't think I've seen... I think it's all the trails that are existing now are the only trails that are going to be there. So I don't know what the number of miles is. I think the only addition would be a parking area near the entrance on Chestnut Plain Road. Okay. The, on, the only reason I ask is just for if, if it's going to be more, if we're putting in a parking lot and it's going to be more widely used um, to have access for emergency services on the trail system, um, in order to get to somebody yeah. that we can't yeah. get. To. I don't remember how that was addressed, but there was um, a portion of that where they did address that on the main road coming in. Okay. Yeah, because okay. I mean, we've, we've talked about UTVs, ATVs and stuff in the past to get to some other areas of town that are, you know, trails that may be something to, to consider moving mm -hmm. forward if we're going to be adding areas like this, public areas like this to to do something as far as public access. I mean, it's already there. The trails are already there. People already use them. So that, to whatever. Putting a parking lot is going to encourage more people. Right. Exactly. But, 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 but the, parking, the parking lot that's being discussed is sort of like four cars. Yeah. So yeah. It's not a big parking lot. And also, there's, there's no question. And this actually was discussed that these trails will now be fully managed and maintained. And yeah. so access from emergency vehicles, I, I believe, will be enhanced because they won't have to slog through trails that, that, are, that are just marginally uh, maintained. So access, I think, will increase uh, appropriately. Okay. Okay, let me leave it like uh, the request hanging right now for a couple of days. And if anybody watching this has questions or, or wants a presentation, please contact me or, or Brian and uh, I'll get back early next week with, uh, with Scott to tell him what we decided, so. Okay. Does anybody hey, have Brad, anything else to discuss Brad, today? Brad, keep in mind that, that Scott is representative of Castro Land Trust. He's not a representative of right. the town in this capacity. And he's in, in fact, um, uh, I'm missing the word. He has recused himself from a, I believe he has from a CONCOM role because of his role with Kestrel. Oh, okay. Uh, before we go our separate ways, what time would work for a meeting on Monday to finalize, to sign the warrant? Oh. Um, no, you, you're actually, you're looking at actually going to your office to sign? Um, well, we'll have to meet virtually any, we'll have to meet virtually. 
Um, and yeah, if at least two people could stop by and sign. So it would probably make sense to have it earlier in the day. Yeah. I'm, I'm free all day for, uh, at this point. So 10 a.m.? All right, hold on, hold on, hold on. I think my preference would be early afternoon. Um, no, it's, it's I'm going to send this to town council. Um, hopefully after the finance committee meeting tomorrow. So it'll probably take the weekend. So if I give them a noon Monday deadline. Okay. Okay. I cannot do mid morning on Monday. I could do nine or I could do at this point around noon. What's what's noon, noon, 12, one o'clock, 12. Okay, well, let's do a 12 o'clock Zoom meeting and then sign by what, four o'clock that afternoon? Or, or? Whenever, yeah, whenever anybody can come down. Come down, okay. Okay. All so right. I'll, I'll do it for noon. Okay, 12 noon. Okay. Thank you. Okay, motion to adjourn? Second. All those in favor, Jonathan? Yep. Joyce? Yep. Fred, yes.